have I endured. Alexander was swept overboard and survived, but, but once, once the sea caught in his throat, he was never truly well again. Dead at 46, he left a widow younger than you. Not four years later, his brother also perished. My Edward, Torn from me when the Tennyson sank in a storm returning from Rangoon. Do you remember that night, that February night, when I told you of a cold weight on my chest? Oh, it's just a chill, you say. <laughs> but I felt his part of my heart go dark. It was weeks before the report was made. I have my letter from Tom Noyes, the first mate, who survived eight days adrift. He was the last one to see his captain alive. I kept that letter. Oh, oh you had your goodbye. A, a casket in the parlor, a burial at Oak Hill. I have no remains, you see. You must put an end to it. Quiet your sorrow and let us all sleep in peace. Milk Street from Spring, I'm on my way to meet Mary Blunt Graves for Thanksgiving at her in-laws up on High Street. Yes, the great Graves residence on High. <laughs> Things have been pretty grim up there since the passing of Captain Graves. The whole town has been memorializing him for months. My father says he helped open the China trade in the 1820s and used his fortune to build our fleet of clipper ships, and then made another fortune on their cargo. He helped run the shipyards and banks and marine society for decades. He was even Newburyport's mayor. I can't say I really knew Captain Graves, but my father was a captain alongside his brother, Alexander. And that's 
how I got to know Mary Luntgraves. Oh, <laughs> she's a most unusual woman. Had I been permitted to go back to sea, I'd have been like her. Fit as a man to sail a square rigger and smart as a trader in faraway ports. We rarely speak of such things now. Not since the entire fleet has been sold off and not one of Graves' brother is left. They say steamships are the future. And I have a brother in Liverpool who pilots the tugs in that port, but we're a river town, not a harbor. And here at home, nothing is as it was. Have a care, sir! Why would anyone pull a carriage through these narrow streets? Cursed contraptions! <laughs> <laughs> Always prefer walking where I may, and feeling the wind on my face. Ah, oh, I dare say it comes from having the run of a ship's deck at the tender age of five. <coughs> Fanny, don't stand out in the cold. Did you not wear a bonnet on a day such as this? Oh, I'm warmed from the walk. <laughs> Is that fresh bread you're bringing? Yes. Let me carry your basket so I do not look empty-handed. Well, of course, my dear, but you are so full of words. You need only bring your spirit to enliven the meal. But we shouldn't tarry. Mrs. Graves' Surrey waits for us at the corner. I've heard the widow Graves hasn't been seen in town since the burial weeks ago. Oh, this is why I welcome your company tonight. As will Carolyn. Like you, she has been tasked with the care of both her mother and grandmother. She's been besieged by well-wishers, but has received little assistance from her peers. Yeah. Oh, and how is your mother's health, dear? Mm. Deaf as a post. <laughs> More bad tempered than ever. Oh, she was so proud of that ear horn she procured. Hand carved from Africa. Does that not improve her temper? It brings me no relief from her beck and call. The only thing she wants to hear is word of my brothers. Sadly, their voices don't carry from Liverpool or San Francisco either. Oh, be patient with her, Fanny. Age is not kind to us ladies, and I fear that others may find me cross as well. <laughs> there is no language with what must be held inside. My mother may have spent years journeying to foreign lands as a captain's wife, but Mary Lunt Graves knew how to pilot a ship herself. She helped save the vessel Castilian from crashing upon the reefs in a gale. Not one life or crate of cargo lost. The shipping company gave out a great reward to her husband, of course, <laughs> Captain Alexander Graves. <coughs> Welcome, come in. We shall barely fill up the parlor this Thanksgiving, but there's food enough for a week. Mother is in mourning and still abed, and my brother has chosen to be with his wife's family this Thanksgiving. It smells quite delicious. Whatever has been prepared will gladly help consume it. I have been to many a ho ha home in here with a few men present, but Thanksgiving is gratitude for family, even when they're not present. Mother's gratitude seems strained these last weeks, and Grandmother Susanna has been afflicted with a most quarrelsome manner. I advise you to stay a safe distance from her walking stick. <laughs> I have set my mind to be festive this evening. We shall heap praise on your table and enjoy the society of each other. Morning is not unlike the doldrums at sea. I can recall days off the Cape of Good Hope where the ocean was flat and the air hung heavy without a puff of movement. The breeze returns of its own accord and only then could we carry on. <laughs> but we can be festive in this respite. Here is fresh baking and a mince meat pie from Mary Lunt. If you have a second cane, I shall take it up and joust with your grandmother. Oh, God. oh that would be a distraction, I'm sure. <laughs> Please come sit in the parlor while I let the cook know we're all here and have these warmed. 
Really, Fanny, even your peers don't know what to make of your manners. <laughs> who are you trying to shock? No one, but with the men absent, who do we need to please? <laughs> Poor girl has no idea how boastful she is, right? forever going on about for one so year long. on her father's Two and a half years on ship, <laughs> almost so 20 true. years ago. <laughs> My brother could <laughs> never abide her. Our mothers once fancied a union between our families. <laughs> But Fanny Bray was never one to court. My favorite Thanksgiving of all was aboard the Beaumont. Our cook was a free black who let me help tend the hens and turkeys. His prize bird escaped its pen, and you should have seen the crew try to coax it down off the rigging. <laughs> he flew overboard, and it was the most memorable meal we never got to eat. <laughs> I shall seat her next to Grandmother. Mm. Aunt Mary and I can watch from afar. <laughs> you must have heard what happened to our cook years later, when the Volant was in New Orleans and he was abducted. Oh, indeed I did. And how your father found where he was imprisoned and, and paid off the bribes to the constable so he could get him back. No ports were safe in slaveholding states. And I suspect are still not, 15 years hence. Didn't your Captain Graves help rescue an actual slave ship bound for Charleston? I know of what you are referring, but I was at home with child during that event. The ship was demasted in the storm, and Alexander told his crew to take on all the survivors. He didn't know the ship's purpose until he witnessed how men had been kept below in chains. Is that as cargo? Is that when he joined the abolitionists? Who told you such a thing? No Graves was ever an abolitionist. People in this town were imprisoned, you know, harbored just so much as, as harbored sympathy for that cause. People in this town were imprisoned by, by people whose profits were, were measured by such commerce. Yes, I know, but that was all before the war. I have to believe you are proud of Captain Graves for not subscribing to such Corruption, principles. Yeah. Newburyport sent plenty of its own young men to fight men's slavery. Well, the laws may have changed, yes. But the war didn't change everyone's loyalties. It's just that I wanted you to know how much I admired him, your husband. Sally Noyce told me that her father used to drive the hay wagon from the South End to the Chain Bridge and a secret route to New Hampshire. Oh, hush, when they push. Or I should grow angry with you. No, we are guests in this house, and Carolyn has just laid her father to rest. He was my husband's employer, as well as your father's. And Captain Graves, he helped build the volant and other businesses in this town. But there is much of it we are not privy to in those dealings. I meant no offense. I would never know say what I think and what you may believe. Keep in your heart. But as guests in this house, I beg of you, hold your tongue. Oh. <laughs> what are you plotting in hushed tones and whispers? And who is your guest, Mary Lunt? Oh, good evening, Susanna. Surely you remember Fanny Bray? She attended lessons. I don't with... recall her being so loud. <laughs> Nana, can I help you to your seat? Well, I don't see your mother, Carolyn. Could you not rouse her from her bed? Can she not attend to the activities of her own Thanksgiving table? A little is required of us once our children are grown. But shall I speak with her? How long are we to indulge in this behavior, Mary Lunt? Be patient with her, Nana. It is like a sickness. I remember when Mother would tend me in illness, bring me trays of broth, and let me sleep until the fever passed. The veils of sleep temper her sadness. It costs me little to help. Where we men, it would be pints of ale in the tavern and forgetfulness from drink. <laughs> there is a weakness in men and women alike, but we graves are not known for it. It is not in our nature to court forgetfulness, nor to rebuke the will of the Lord. How did you comport yourself, Mary Lunt, when Alexander was laid to rest? Oh, well, I scarcely recall. But I do know I was much helped by those around me. Your son was well loved by his shipmates, <coughs> as well as his family. And by every captain of the Marine Society, and all who knew him. As was my father, 
although I don't see the point in comparisons. Oh, it's different when men work shoulder to shoulder with each other. And Mary Lunch traveled on each of his vessels, an ambassador with the merchant's wives and foreign ports, and she also... My father employed half the town and was president of the Marine Society. Do you know what year he was born? No, but it was 1811, <laughs> the year of the Great Fire. We were in Salisbury and watched as more than two-thirds of Newburyport burned to the ground. They may have rebuilt the town with bricks, but no other person did more to restore its prosperity in one lifetime from the ashes to one of the wealthiest towns in the Commonwealth. Precisely. See, Fanny, not everything is about your precious boats. William's legacy is indeed a great one. But our town's leader was also your mother's captive and your partner. And I feel for her left to have to remake a world without him. Oh, you may squabble amongst yourselves, but family pride isn't going to keep this household solvent, Missy. Nor are Mary Lund's <laughs> peculiar adventures at voyaging. And as they're not building ships here anymore. How can you let that old harpy say such things? You saved her son's life. You saved the Castilian from crashing on the reefs and taking its whole crew with it. Everyone knows how heroic you were. It doesn't matter now. Alexander is gone. The work is gone. And you mustn't make so much out of our luck that night. It was another time. I mean, it was every crewman who helped save the Castilian. But it was you at the wheel who steered the ship. I've heard about it all my life. Well, it does make a good story. <laughs> and it's better to say heroic than terrified. <laughs> so pitifully small, like between the roar of the wind and the waves crashing down on me. I was drenched, and I could barely make my way to cross the deck, but I held fast and hard to the wheel. It was others who reefed the sails and called out the headings when I couldn't even see through the spray. Others who got a line out to Alexander and hauled him back in, but he was badly hurt. I prayed to the, I prayed at the wheel. I prayed that we would make it to shore so that he could be made well again. Clipper ships are finely made, and the, and the crew become a part of them, an extension of the sails, the sheets, the keels, the rudder. But even so, we are still serve at the whim of the wind in the ocean. But we were fully loaded in the storm and no cargo was lost. We owe our thanks to God and our fame to the investors. <laughs> but venison was fully loaded in the storm and all the cargo was lost. Well, Alexander recovered and received special commendation. They commissioned a portrait of a Castilian by the renowned maritime artist Duncan McFarland. It was an honor. She sailed from, from Calcutta on the 16th of January, 1873, and, and sank off the coast of Mauritius on February 22nd. The loss, along with the ship, was $435,000. Would you like some sherry? Among the inventory, 4,400 capsules of linseed oil, 187 chests of indigo, 9,950 buffalo hides, 352 cases of shellac, 85,000 goat skins, 800 bales of juke butts, 81 packages of India rubber, 97 bundles of fishing rods, when well, the indigo alone was worth $70,000. Tennyson was insured through offices in New York and Boston and Philadelphia. I wondered how Edward could ever return to Rangoon. It was there that he lost his wife Elizabeth in childbirth, and he crossed back to America with his infant daughter and sent her to live with kinfolk in Maine. But she died of the fever at the age of five. We shared a house with Edward on Milk Street, and I never saw him bitter. 
I have my letter from Tom Noyes, the account of the storm. He also wrote this. Edward Graves had been to sea since he was 16 years of age, 27 years, and he was one of the most competent and, and energetic shipmasters of us all. Of good judgment, the utmost confidence paired with skill and capacity. He was a man of amiable character, known for, for his kindness, to all who served under him. I have had enough of the sea. I am grateful my son Josiah prefers his studies to the lore of faraway ports. We in this town have more knowledge of the world than most Americans do. We felt so worldly. But in the end, it was just a business. And that business got old. Fishing poles, two putts, India rubber, fishing poles. <coughs> I thought you were getting the sherry, but you didn't come back. Everything about this place is used up. When I do leave, I won't come back. I have my books for adventure. <coughs> Stevenson, Hugo, Dumas. Who wants to live in someone else's dream world? I shall go to California. My brother sailed there and never left. San Francisco. And no sailing. You can take a train all the way west from Chicago, across more land than there is ocean. How would you know anybody? What would you do? <laughs> I think your own country scares you. I'm tired of living in gloom. Gloom from the war, and the boys that never returned, and the ships that never returned. Why sit around waiting for things to come back, when I can go where everything is new? My brothers have both the country away. I couldn't leave my mother, even if I were to marry. Well, I shall probably wait for the spring. We can all make do for now. For all that we have, and all we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Leave her, John.